again, these kinds of things are not brought up when you take geology classes. They just say, look at these thrust faults that move slowly over millions of years. And look at the oil in Wyoming. It's 150 million years old. How can oil be 150 million years old? Think about that. Mm -hmm. Just sitting there waiting for us to tap into, sitting there for 150 million years. And the more I stay groundwater flow in, in the Western Michigan, and, and, and you guys are a great school on groundwater there in Waterloo. A wonderful, wonderful research institution for groundwater. We studied a lot of your work when I was getting my PhD. Uh, you know, you can't, it was, there's groundwater everywhere. It's always moving. So you can, you know, they argue that these were pasteurized somehow at 80 degrees Celsius, and they stayed that way for 150 million years magically. Well, you've got groundwater flow coming in all the time, bringing in new bacteria. And we've got bacteria over three miles deep. As far as we've drilled, the water still contains bacteria. So you're going to still cause biodegradation. And so you're going to biodegrade these oils away. They'll be gone within probably a few thousand years. They're not going to last. You, you know, you put gasoline in your shed somewhere in your back or in your barn or wherever you have. Leave it there for 30 years and try to use it. It's not going to work. You know, it's going to, it, it has an expiration date, essentially. It, it'll start to decay and break down. In the ground, it does the same thing. It just does it slower because there's not as much oxygen. But that's why you guys have the tar sands in Alberta. Because that's biodegraded right down to tar. That's why most oil in Wyoming is very thick. Uh, it's a uh, low gravity oil, they call it, because it's been biodegraded quite a bit, but it's not 150 million years old. You know, it's just, but they, they teach all the geologists that when I was looking for oil there, that's what they tell you. They just say these things, but in reality, the, the reality of it is you've got groundwater flow coming all the time. We can't dispose of any hazardous waste without it leaking somewhere. Everything leaks. Nucle that's why we we're so afraid to get rid of our nuclear waste, because it's going to leak. You know, everything in the natural world leaks. It's just some are faster than others and some are slower than others, but everything's going to leak. And so even oil that's trapped in these rocks, they can't last that long. Oil, to me, oil is, is screaming young earth. Dinosaur soft tissues are screaming young earth. These deep cold slabs in the mantle screaming young earth. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for a young earth. And then all these layers stacked on top of each other, on and on and on, the flat coal seams, the flat beds, flat beds, flat beds, just like bricks on a wall. Where's the time? Right. right. You, know, you can do your reading, make the day and all you want. But those are built on a lot of assumptions. And they assume, of course, that no water is moving in out of the system, bringing in minerals. And most of these, I get rid of a lot of them because they're radioactive. Most of my, behind me, I have a lot of dinosaur bone pieces that I brought back from Wyoming, the, the junk. And they're radioactive. We put a Geiger count. They're flipping off off the scale because they're full of uranium. It was it was flowed moved by groundwater flow. Uranium is very soluble. So just to say, oh, I know how much uranium was here originally. I know how much lead was here originally. That's just that's ludicrous. When you study groundwater, which not many geologists do enough of, you realize everything's moving in the system all the time. There's no closed system, and even these isochron, you know, these curves that they do. Uh, they're they're mixing curves. You right, don't know what right. the end numbers are, and and so there's a lot of problems with age dating. So don't just say they're this old because of that. You now those are all built on a lot of assumptions that, of course, they assume this and this and this. And then of course it works. Look at that. And then they call it science, <laughs> but they get the numbers they want. And and we're we're you know you're there's a lot of numbers they have to toss out because they don't fit the system. The right age they get 300 million. It's supposed to be 600 million. You know we sent samples off, found out there's a rock Precambrian rock layer. Uh, lava down there was they intruded in before the Tapete sandstone it was found out that was younger than the rock layer that flowed over the top of Grand Canyon if it was already carved, which would have been you know in the Ice Age, very recent. And so you get numbers like that, and they say, well, those can't be right. But we sent them off the labs, you know, through a third party. Nobody you know knew the difference, and but that's the numbers you get sometimes. They, if you don't know, that's they'll give you the real numbers they get, but they're totally wrong. You know, even an evolutionist would say that's nonsense. But that's the numbers they came back at. In the same rock sent to different labs doing different tests, rubidium strontium versus uranium lead or something. You get numbers that are sometimes a couple or orders of magnitude different. So you can't say just because you know this rock gets the same age all the time. The age dates are, are very, very subjective. And I don't trust any of them because you can't go back in time and verify them. Right. Yeah, how right. do you verify these ages? How do you really say this was? Dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. No, wait, they changed that to 66. What's a million years between friends? You know, just recently <laughs> they changed that. So a lot of people, you know, oh, we knew it was 65 and now the asteroid hit 66 million. But don't get me started on the asteroid. That's another whole talk. <laughs> uh, the, asteroid, know, 
There's no crater there. Number one, there's no crater. That's a gravity anomaly, which is the most ambiguous type of geophysics you can possibly ever come up on. We didn't even use gravity with the oil company early because it's just hocus pocus nonsense. All I was telling you is different density rocks are there somewhere where they're deep, shallow. It all adds up to the signal. So there's sort of a semicircular feature. I think it's just two things overlapping. So okay, the chick, so the, the chick the exolab, crater. is that what it's called? That that chick, crater chick, is chick salub. Chick salub. Yeah, there's no crater. There's no there's no crater there. There's just the gravity signal. They show you gravity maps all the time. They don't always tell you it's a gravity anomaly. There's no I looked at all the oil wells drilled into that as part of my research. And there's no iridium in the 10 wells. There are only three of the 10 wells showed any iridium, which is supposed wow. to be the dust that went up. Right. And then uh, another thing, they, there's almost no melted rock there. If a big impact as big as they say hit, you know, there should have been three to four kilometers of melt. And in one well, we get 300 meters of melt. In the other well, we get about 100 meters. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. The rest of them show almost nothing. So where's the heat generated from the impact? Where's the iridium? You know, where's the smoke from the smoking gun? Uh, where's the crater? You know, they shot seismic across it and they try to say, oh, we proved this. I'm like, you keep, they just misinterpreted their seismic. They just drilled into the basement, you know, into the granite. They kept drilling granite for, I think, 500 feet. And all the fractures in that granite, all the pre-impact pre fractures that are sealed over with minerals are still in the same orientation. They're all still going the same direction. Be it that rock was supposed to have shot out from the middle and moved several miles and splat. And I asked them at a conference, I said, how do you explain that? As a structural geologist, how do you explain that these things didn't even get twisted and distorted? And they just looked at me and blinked. And I kept pressuring them. How do you explain that? You just told me that this is what you found. You know, how do you explain that? You know, why didn't these things get twisted around and all distorted? You know, you're saying all the pre-impact fractures are still in the same orientation. And they kept blinking, and they never addressed that in their papers. That was at a GSA conference, and I don't know, back before COVID, it wasn't that long ago. So, you know, when you ask them questions and and put their uh, you know, really kind of pressure them a little bit. I wasn't doing that as a creationist. I was just as a structural geologist. To me, that didn't make any sense. But you know, number one, Chick's Loop, there's no crater. Wow. Number two, there's not enough melt. Number three, there's not enough iridium. You know, I've heard people say, well, the iridium blew away. But you can go to one hill in Montana, there's iridium. You go to the next hill, there isn't. You know, there's iridium throughout the rock record by volcanoes. And the volcanic eruptions, the subduction zone volcanoes are erupting all over the place. Uh, you know, it's just... Yeah, I see this whole worldwide iridium. There's no worldwide <laughs> iridium layer. There's worldwide iridium in a bunch of different layers. As I said, there's some places it's there and the next hill it's not. And, you know, it's 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 kind of hocus pocus because they're looking for it at this one level only. And But it's below it. It's above it. You know, there's iridium all over from volcanoes. Volcanoes can produce a lot of iridium. So and even is, is this... Is this worldwide volcanism during the flood, basically? Oh, yeah, there, the flood, you were peaking volcanic activity as you started subducting even more and more. So I can actually show you on my graphs the different rock types, which I think I did in my first book. I can show you that I kept track of the volcanic extrusions like lavas and ash as much as I could. And that peaks starts to really go up in the Absarica, the fourth mega sequence, the fifth mega sequence, the Zuni, when I think the flood peaked. And in the in the receding phase, that's when you see most of the volcanic activity is happening, and that's where you're seeing all the iridium being produced. But you can go around, if you want to believe it, you can go around, just look at the KPG boundary, the you know, the KT boundary, and oh, look, there's iridium here. There's, but you can go to some hills, there's not there, or some places it is. But if you look above and below that, you're going to see layers of iridium too. But if we go to Chicxulub, their whole site down there where they say there's, a, there's no crater, no <laughs> crater, and there's almost no iridium. And wow. they looked and looked, look, these are all cored. <clears throat> yeah, they, they find a volcanic intrusion. It used to be a volcanic intrusion. That's all it was. And I think that's all it really is, just an intrusion of magma that came in, which gives you that little bit of you know, so-called melt that you do find in one or two wells. So so as creationists, should we then not say that there was a massive asteroid that hit during the flood? That, it, I is that unnecessary, no. basically? I would say it's unnecessary. You know, there were some impacts. Sure, there's one in Sweden, the Siljan crater, I think you say it. It's got flood rocks. You know, there's actually a crater there you can see in the igneous, and there's a few flood rocks on the edges, early flood rocks. So there were some impacts, no doubt. But but this impact to me is is more hocus pocus than anything else. It's interesting. It really, it, you know, this particular one. You know, there's other real craters, but this particular one, you know, they find it at about the KPG boundary. That, but there's nothing there. 
there is no crater. So they're overselling them. them. They're overselling. Oh, yeah. the they need a they need a story. You got to You got <laughs> Why the dinosaurs suddenly disappear in the rock record there? Well, to me, it's they their whole ecosystem was wiped out. Boom, all their plants, all their animals they lived with, boom, they're wiped out. And then the water went high to the next ecological system, which is more the mammal ones and where the humans are probably living highest elevation. And so that's to me that's these big changes in the Permian Triassic. All that stuff is just boom, wipe out entire ecosystems. Boom. Next ecosystem, it's a wider one higher. It's a global phenomenon because this sea level goes up globally. If it's right. gonna rise, it's not gonna just rise in one area. Yeah, that's one explanation for that whopper sand that they try to put forth is they said, well, the Gulf of Mexico dropped sea level 6,000 feet so the sand could get all the way out there and drop into this hole. But you know, if you drop sea level in the Grand Can in the Gulf of Mexico 6,000 feet, it's gonna have to drop worldwide 6,000 feet because it's all connected by groundwater flow. Everything's connected. People don't study groundwater enough. Groundwater is shoots a lot of holes in a lot of evolutionary stories, like <laughs> old oil. You know, you, you just can't do things. People don't think about that. I wish I understood groundwater flow as well as I did when I worked for oil and gas company. You know, because oil has to move on the backs of the water to to migrate from its source to its ultimate trap. But that trap's not going to last there for millions of years. So to me, the rocks don't tell you how old they are, but there's things in the rocks that do tell you these rocks are young, Good like point. the original tissues and dinosaurs, you know. And I want Howard and others to explain to me how you get, there's been over 130 papers now finding original proteins as deep as rocks supposedly 500 million years ago in the yeah. Cambrian, worm proteins. All the way through the rock record, we see carbon-14 dates of diamonds we've sent off. They're supposed to be a billion years old or more. They come back with measurable carbon, showing they're only thousands of years old. All these things, dinosaurs, carbon-14, the carbon-13 ratios are still valid. So you can't say it's contamination because why wouldn't the carbon-13 be altered? Carbon-13 still shows valid uh, isotopes, which is a stable isotope. Uh, and I studied some of that in my grad school as well, stable isotopes a little bit more water. But the carbon-13, which they always measure with carbon-14, shows valid numbers. Then why would the carbon-14 be contamination, not the carbon-13? Uh, so there's, there's big questions out there that, you know, people don't really look at it. They don't ask because they're just buying into what they've been taught. And it's, you know, for me, it was so easy to almost buy into it when I was in grad school working on my PhD just to say, oh, you know, I give up. And, and trying to be a young with creationist and keep your mouth shut. Because <laughs> you're constantly being bombarded with the other side of the story. But when you really start looking at the data, like I had the chance to do the last 12 years and look at Chicxulub area and all the cores drilled into there because I was working, you know, that area of North America when they finish up and work in the South America, it shows a completely different story than what the, the you know, the evolutionary community and the, the modern media just buys into it. And, no, oh, that's why they even made that movie, 65, which, again, should have been 66. And so they would have made that movie and gone back in time. And Is that that movie happened. where he went back in yeah. time? And yeah, it would have already happened. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't happen yet. You know, it would have, because it would have happened a million years before that. So, mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, it's, they don't even... Don't well, trust I, I've science. seen land before time, so I know I know that. Yeah, I grew up on that. So the slee stack, and, and I believe that. I'll, no, it's <laughs> you know it's science fiction stuff. So it's but it teaches a lot of sometimes a lot of bad things if you're not very careful. That's right. Uh, and, but and, but and the, so, over, the over the overall geology you get in these you know GSA and these things that I get all the time, there's good science in there, but it, you got to kind of weave out and extract right. it from the interpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, these idea of river channels, you know, in places that, and these are marine fish that are now deposited in Green River Formation, and they're saying, oh, those are all freshwater herring. But there's no freshwater herring today. There's no freshwater coelacanths today. Just because if I'm with dinosaurs, they say, oh, these are freshwater sharks. These are freshwater coelacanths. These are, you know, herring. But, you know, you get this complete mixing of all these environments all the time. And that's exactly what you'd expect in a global flood. You know, waves right. coming in, bringing in marine critters mixing them with the land animals and the coal seams. And, you know, why do you only see coal seams showing up pretty much at the same time all over the world? And you know, why do you see dinosaurs only in certain layers? What do you, you know, it's because that was the zone they were being buried in. They didn't stray far from their plants. They were designed to eat. And even today, alligators are still eating plants. Biologists dissect them. They're going, why are they still eating plants? Well, that was the original design. You know, God designed animals to eat just plants, including humans. But after the flood, a lot of these plants didn't proliferate. We now mostly have flowering plants, which we're living at highest elevations uh, because the climate's a lot different. God said you can eat animals, you can 
eat the meat. You know, animals can eat each other. It's, they almost have to nowadays, the way you change the world. But it's uh, very, very interesting. A lot of the things you're taught, just like chicks loop, when you look at the facts, you know, you, even the shot quartz and all these different things can be are found in Indonesia in volcanoes. I mean, they're finding that same stuff because a lot of these magmas crystallize so quickly, coming up so fast that they shock their own magma chambers and create the shock quartz and iridium. And it's, it's just amazing how, you know, volcanoes can explain most of the features we see at, you know, around the world in terms of its iridium. But there's not just one layer. You got to get that out of your head. There's not just one layer of iridium. And even that's not continuous. There's a lot of layers of iridium. And you just happen to be concentrating on the KEPG boundary. The dinosaurs disappear and go, oh, look, this iridium is the same as over here. It's found in, you know, 100 places around the world. Well, there's another 10,000 places where it's not found at that level. They don't talk about that. And so show me the crater is what I say. The answer at all. Yeah. We got off on a good tangent here. but to, No, that's, that's great. That is another you, clip you know, as a geologist, a controversial issue. Show me the crater, <laughs> not just the gravity anomaly, because that's all they show you is a gravity anomaly, which is the most ambiguous geophysical data of all because it can be made by so many things, deep deep density differences, shallow density differences, they all add together to give you that signal we're measuring. And so it just tells you there's something weird going on there, a couple of overlapping things. And so to me, uh, you know, it's a great time to be a creation geologist, but we need yeah, more. Amen.